Uh, after church today, photos will be taken for our directory. If you have not had your photo taken, go to the education building after the service today, and those photos will be taken. So again, Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. And I'll ask if you're able, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God? In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town called Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed and there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the word of the living God. Let's bow our heads and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, we pray that as we continue to walk through the gospel of Luke, that you would open our hearts and our eyes uh, to the reality of Christ, the reality that we are to walk in his ways and live as that royal priesthood. We thank you for everything given. It's in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I do hope so far that you're enjoying the walkthrough of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, as we spoke about opening up when I opened up the Gospel of Luke, there's different ways to look at uh, the text as we go through. Number one, you can read it as simply narrative, and what is going on in the story, and that's, that's a well and good thing. But there's also the second portion of that, and that's doctrine. And we look at the doctrine of Christ as we walk through the gospel of Luke. And not only that, but the gospel of God Himself, Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all in one. We see this in the gospel of Luke. I want you to open your eyes and I want you to see this morning as we open up Luke, He's writing about this miracle of birth. You've seen that? He's focusing in the very opening of the gospel of Luke on the miracle of birth with two separate women. So twice in one chapter, the angel Gabriel comes and announces that life will come from nothing, from an older woman who was barren and a younger woman who was a virgin. As it stands in Elizabeth, life would come where there was once death. And you think of the gospel bringing spiritual life to where there was once spiritual death. Death. I want you to see this dichotomy as we walk through this. Again, Gabriel speaking to Elizabeth and announcing that life would come where there was once death. Birth would come where birth was not possible. And then in Mary, announcing again that life would come where there was no choice or decision for Mary to get pregnant. It was all of God, every bit of this. In both of these instances, talking about the miracle of birth... God brings life out of nothing. And in John chapter 3, if you were to go there, we're not going there this morning, Jesus is going, going to go and tell Nicodemus about a different miracle of birth. And that is a spiritual birth that you must be born again from God, teaching the very same lessons in spiritual birth that he has done opening up in the gospel of Luke, that God was the one that brings life from nothing when there was nothing at all. And this morning, these two women will come together and rejoice at the power of God and everything that He promises. Elizabeth's pregnancy was a sign to Mary. Remember, remember last week we looked at Elizabeth and her pregnancy in the weeks that have preceded us, and now we've entered into Mary. Last week we hear the angel Gabriel has given Mary this revelation or, or, or picture that he, she will be the mother of the Messiah and Mary's going to seek proof of this promise. Can you imagine if, if you were Mary and you hear God the Father saying you're going to have a son and he's going to be the Messiah? You know, two questions arise. Number one, how can this happen? Because I've never been with a man. And number two, what am I going to do about this? How do I know this is absolutely true? And so Gabriel gives Mary proof that God can do the impossible. This morning, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 36. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived the son. And this is the sixth month 
with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Now, we all know that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, okay? So there's no doubt that Mary knew of Elizabeth's infertility. She knew, no doubt, probably, that they had been trying all of their marriage, Zechariah and Elizabeth, to have a child and couldn't conceive, and she knew of her barrenness in this. It seemed improbable that God could give Elizabeth a child. And the angel Gabriel says, and think about this, as Gabriel says these things to Mary, Mary's wondering how this can happen. Gabriel says, just so you know, your cousin's pregnant. And immediately Mary cues in, Elizabeth's barren. How can that happen? Mary's asking her own questions about how she can be pregnant because she's a virgin. And Gabriel says, I know you got questions. Your cousin's pregnant. So immediately, why does Mary go see Elizabeth? To verify the promise that God could actually do what was being told. This improbable thing. And so Mary rushes off to visit her cousin Elizabeth to confirm that God could actually do what He promised. Look at verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town called Judah. Now, when the text says, in those days, it's referring to in the days around the time that Gabriel had came and spoke to Mary. And in the same days. So what that is telling you is Mary didn't waste any time. She didn't take time to plan a a little vacation and, and talk to her friends and family. She left. She went with haste to get there because she wanted to verify this promise that had been given to her by the angel to see if indeed her cousin was pregnant. And Mary traveled to the hill country, if you notice in the text, of Judah. I want to explain this to you to show how how amazing this is. Mary lived in Nazareth, okay? That's 91 miles approximately from Judah. So Mary could have traveled 9 to, to 10 miles a day, maybe, And this means the trip at 9 to 10 miles a day would have taken her at least 10 days. This is before they had cars or scooters here. All right. Furthermore, she's traveling to the hill country, not traveling straight roads. It's not an easy trip, uh, let alone for a, a young lady of probably 13 or 14 who had nobody with her. It's a very dangerous trip as well that Mary is embarking on, 91 miles through the hill country to Judah. This is the track that she's going on. So this was a very, very dangerous journey for a young lady by herself who was pregnant as well. And when Mary arrived, Elizabeth greeted her. Look at verse 40. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. I think sometimes when you are not familiar with ancient Near East culture, a little bit of the text is lost on us. Uh, In the example here, and it says, she entered the house and was greeted by Elizabeth. In the ancient Near East, uh, a greeting was not, hey, how you doing? Great to see you. That's not their cultural greeting. In the ancient Near East, it was a catching up, I guess. It was talking. It was fellowshipping many times for hours on into the night. So this text in the original language is telling us that they had a lot of catching up to do. They greeted. And in that word greeting is a lot in that. They were talking about what God had done and and catching up and rejoicing at the miracle of their birth. Verse 40 summarizes this power of God. Uh, John MacArthur said this, Mary hearing Elizabeth's account and even more seeing her condition also confirmed to Mary that God would keep His word to her. So you can see that Mary was anxious to get to Elizabeth with haste through the hill country, whatever it took so that she could verify the promise that was given to her. Because no doubt there were questions, there were doubts even in Mary's mind. And when Gabriel said, your cousin, who is an older woman, is pregnant, who was barren once, Mary had to get there to see if it was true. Because if it was true, that would mean it was also true for her. Look at verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
the unborn John the Baptist leapt in the baby's or in the mother's womb at this time. And John, again, reminding you, was to be the forerunner to proclaiming Messiah. So he was proclaiming as much as he could right now. He, he was proclaiming even in the womb, bouncing in the womb that here is the Messiah. He was fulfilling his calling even before he was born. We live in a culture right now that wouldn't rejoice in this, this baby in the womb. We live in a culture that says that the baby is nothing more than a cluster of cells, that it has no value, that abortion is the right way to go so that younger ladies can have their prosperity later in life. And abortion is a satanic practice that is rooted in the worship of a demon god named Moloch. I'll show you this briefly this morning. Uh, Moloch was the god of the Canaanites. We don't have a lot of time to go into this this morning, but the worshipers of Moloch built a huge bronze statue, the head of a bull and the body of a man, and, and the statue had its hands out, outstretched like this, these bronze hands of Moloch, outstretched and, and cupped. And when the pagan nations would hold their ceremonies, they would heat up the bottoms of these bronze hands with fire until they were burning hot. And then the, they would call the people to place their firstborn on the hands of the statue of Moloch while it sizzled and burned to death. They did this in hopes of receiving blessings because that was the promise from the worshipers, from the priest of Moloch, that they would have a blessed life, that they would be prosperous in their life if they sacrificed their firstborn. And so mothers would willingly place their firstborn on the statue's hands and let the baby burn to death in hopes of health and wealth. The priest of Moloch during this time, during these ceremonies, would actually bang on many, many drums to drown out the cries of the screaming, burning babies. It was a horrific practice by godless people. But I'm going to tell you it's a tragedy when God's people would participate in these same rituals in the Old Testament. And God addressed His people, Jeremiah, who were practicing the worship of Moloch and sacrificing their children. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 33, God addresses His people. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name and defile it. They built upon high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Israel knew the Word of God. These were God's chosen people, but they had refused to listen to God. They sought their own gods to give them prosperity. It reminds me a lot of my little soapbox, the, the Christian bookstores per se today. That God's people claim to be God's people, claim to be listening to the Word of God, but they listen more to fables that are in bookstores than they do reading their Bibles. This was the state of Israel. To claim that, wait, we love God, but we just need a little prosperity. And this, this priest of Moloch is saying, if we do these things, then our life will be prosperous. That we'll have our best life now. And so God's people abandoned the Lord and sacrificed to a false god in order to gratify the desires of their heart. If you want to summarize the, the message of Moloch, the priest of Moloch, this is what that would be. Sacrifice your children, and I will bless you to reach your prosperous plans and goals in life. That's what Moloch would say. That, that was the message of Moloch. Now this morning, I want to read to you from the Planned Parenthood website, their mission statement. Planned Parenthood says this on their website, ask yourself if you have what you need to take care of a child like time. Raising children is a super important full-time job and it can impact, watch this, your other plans and goals. These two messages are very similar, aren't they? Today children are not sacrificed in fire but on the altar of convenience. 
The statistics are heartbreaking when it comes to abortion. Current abortion rate is 1.2 million babies killed each year in the United States. 3,315 babies murdered each day, 138 babies murdered each hour. If you want to summarize this, Planned Parenthood is our modern-day Moloch. That's all it is. Same system. And many unbelievers and a great many professing Christians, even, sadly, pastors, are bowing at the feet of this modern-day Moloch. Virgil Walker wrote this, If your pastor is pro-choice, he's not a pastor. He's a politician masquerading as a pastor in the pulpit. God destroyed the nation of Israel because they had turned their backs on Him and chose to murder their own children. Now I want to ask a question this morning. As Christians in the United States of America, do we think we are better than Israel in any way? Do we think for one moment that God will not judge His people in the same way? To pour down wrath upon His people in the same way? We look at the calamities that go on in in the United States many times and Christians pray like they don't believe in a sovereign God at times. Lord, what are you going to do about this? Lord, the nation's going away in a handbasket. Lord, what are we going to do without contemplating that this is from God? Everything we see is from God's hands. Do we ever question that it might be, just maybe, judgment upon God's people for not standing on His Word? You see, there's a difference from from even hearing the Word and preaching the Word. There's a difference we as Christians are called to action. And we hear these things, but what do we do about them? How do we stand firm? How do we fight for the lives of the unborn? Children are a blessing, not a burden. We see that this morning through the Gospel of Luke. In just the text where the baby is leaping in the womb, nothing in Scripture would point to say that that baby was a clump of cells jumping. It was verifiably an alive human and from God. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Real quickly, I want to look at why this is. Uh, If you have your Bible, you can turn briefly to Psalm chapter 127. 127, Psalm 127. We'll come back to Luke in just a minute. If you read the Psalms, Psalm 120 through 134 are what you would call songs of ascent. They were sung by worshipers of God as they traveled the road to Jerusalem to their yearly annual festivals. They would sing these Psalms, as Brother David said this morning. The church would sing these Psalms as they're walking the road to Jerusalem to these religious festivals. And they would see Solomon's temple as they walked the road to Jerusalem. This grand temple, this big site, the most beautiful structure of its time. And these psalms that were sung were praises to prepare the people's heart. And Psalm 127 was a psalm of ascent as worshipers approached Solomon's temple. They would sing this. Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who built it in labor... In vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So as worshipers are walking towards Solomon's temple and they they see this grand sight, the Psalm 127 would remind them that man didn't build this temple. God did. God built this temple. It is the Lord who sustains and builds the temple, not the pagan nations. Now, I want you to watch this. This Psalm 127, stay with me, was a song to prepare the people's heart for worship. And it begins pointing people to the temple saying, God built this, not man. And then there's a a shift in the psalm that King David, who wrote it, makes a beautiful shift and compares the temple to humanity spiritual temple of flesh to a human family. Look at Psalm 127.3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Psalm 127 begins describing the house of stone, transitions to describing the house of flesh. And the idea is that even in the house of flesh, even in pregnancy, man didn't do this, God did. 
God's the one who provides the child in the womb. Therefore, it's not a mistake. Charles Spurgeon wrote this about this psalm. This points to another mode of building up a house, namely to leave descendants to keep our name and family alive upon the earth. Without this, what is a man's purpose in accumulating wealth? To what purpose does he build a house if he has none in his household to hold the house after him? Yet in this matter, a man is powerless without the Lord. So just as building Solomon's temple, it was God who builds the family. And in pregnancy, it is ultimately God who places a child in the womb. Children are a heritage, a legacy from the Lord. And again, sadly, our culture makes the mistake, and they mistake burden for blessing. It's not a godly legacy that many want in life. It's immediate, fleeting self-gratification. The legacy we leave with our children is not for us, but it's for God. John Howard Hinton wrote this, There's no greater blessing than for children to have godly parents, and the next, for parents to have godly children. Psalm 127.4. Just continue a bit more in this. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Now I want you to consider things. Consider what this text is saying. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. A warrior has arrows, doesn't he, to engage in battle. And warriors made these arrows. If you look back at the Roman Empire, they would sharpen these arrows, make them as sharp as they, they could to go into battle, making them strong, making them able to pierce the worst darkness. And when the time was right, the warriors of the Roman Empire would shoot these arrows that they handmade out into the heart of the enemy. As Christians, we sharpen our children, but not for physical war, for spiritual war. We disciple them from early years so that they may be shot into the world and penetrate the darkness with the gospel. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in the house and when you are walking by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, children are to be raised to carry the banner and the legacy of Christ to the nations. And as parents, as grandparents, as aunts, uncles, when we look at the children that God has given us, what's our priority with that? Is our priority Christ? Or is our priority education, activity, other things, friends, popularity with our kids? Where's the priority with our children? Is it that they would carry the legacy of Christ or that they would carry the banner of our surname? That they would be a, a blessing to others with His Word or, or that they would be a good reflection on us? Psalm 127 says the purpose, the very purpose of children is that we would raise them, sharpen them up, have a quiver full of arrows and shoot them out into the world as image bearers of Christ and the gospel. So where will you leave your legacy with your child or your grandchild? Are you sharpening them in the ways of the Lord or in the ways of the world? The more arrows, the bigger blessing. Amen? Psalm 20, 127, just a bit more of this. Verse 5, Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. Pastor Vody Bauckham wrote this. Our culture's view of the appropriate number of children in the family is a boy for me and a girl for you, and praise the Lord, we're finally through. <laughs> but he's right, isn't he? It's abnormal for a family to have more than two children. It's seen as countercultural a little bit, isn't it? Being a pastor with five kids, Lacey and I frequently get asked the question, Many questions. She more than me when she goes to the grocery store without me. It's, it's comical to her that people will come up and the first question they'll say is, are all five of those yours? And she responds and says, yep, and they have the same baby daddy. <laughs> the 
The Bible says, blessed is the man who has a quiver full of them. Arrows is what the Bible compares children to. Sharp arrows. And blessed is the one who has a quiver full of them. Our conservative Christian culture is losing its influence in the world because we have first lost our influence in the home with children. Abortion is a travesty, splitting up one of the greatest blessings of God, and that is children. So praise God for godly arrows, and that we as the church would begin to sharpen them more and more. Now, back to the text in Luke. Elizabeth's proclamation of joy. Verse 42 of chapter 1, And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So I want you to watch this. After being filled with the Spirit, Elizabeth rejoiced. Did you hear what I, I said? Catch this. After being filled with the Spirit, Elizabeth rejoiced. The Spirit filled her first, and then she could rejoice in the promise of God. You see, the Spirit empowered this. She was filled with the Spirit, the text says, and then she rejoiced. And she exclaimed with a loud cry to, to Mary, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth declares that Mary is the most blessed, not because of her, but because of Christ. Last week, Pastor Garrett did a wonderful job uh, explaining the differences in Christianity in brief and Catholicism. And he touched on the fact that the, the Catholic Church in great part, even in their, their catechisms, teach that Mary is somehow greater blessed than any woman on the face of the earth because of her, because of how great she was, saying she was even a dispenser of grace and being sinless at times. This is what Catholic Church teaches. By the way, I have many friends who would say to me, hey, the Catholic Church, they're Christians too. They just believe a little bit different. I don't know if you can call somebody a Christian who tells you to worship Mary along with Jesus and puts them together. Because Jesus said, I'm the only way. And the Catholic Church says, no, Mary is a way as well. There was nothing special about Mary as being blessed she was in just as much need of a Savior as you and I are. The blessing of Mary received was totally unmerited and only given to her by the grace and mercy of God. Amen? Same way as our salvation. Not merited, not earned, totally by God's grace and His grace alone. Elizabeth confirms that Jesus is divinity. The biggest question asked, or one of the biggest questions asked about Christ in the Bible and the Scriptures is, many people will say, well, Jesus never said, I am God. Jesus never said, I am the Lord. But He did. He used much stronger language than just saying, I am God. And again, we don't have time to go all through the, the Scriptures to prove this, but, but here's one for you for those that would even say, yeah, Jesus was a good man, but He wasn't the Lord. No, he wasn't God. Elizabeth, in the womb, identified Jesus as the Lord. Look at verse 43. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Remember this, Elizabeth right here is speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? We just read that earlier, that the Spirit filled Elizabeth, and she now is identifying the baby in Mary's womb as the Lord. I'll tell you this morning, without the Spirit, it's impossible to know Jesus. Without the Spirit in you, without the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to identify Christ as the Lord. A person that does not have the Holy Spirit in them cannot do this. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Paul wrote this, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 16, 15 through 17. And Peter, this is Peter and Jesus. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I always have to stop there. It makes me smile inside that Peter must have thought he was something big there. Got the question right. Gold star time. Aren't you proud of me, Jesus? 
You are the Christ. Everybody else is getting it wrong, but I know who you are. You're the Messiah. And I love Jesus' response. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You see, he even calls Peter, you're blessed, Peter. Peter probably thought, you're shooting right, I am. I got it right. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He pulled the rug out from under Peter's boasting. You're blessed, Peter, but you didn't get that answer by yourself. God gave you that answer. There's no way you could have gotten that right unless God had not put His Holy Spirit within you. So you don't get that gold star God does. The only reason you got that right is because God gave you the right answer. And notice that, again, in that text, Jesus calls Peter blessed. So if you take that word blessing, you can misuse it, can't you? Like the Catholic Church would say, hey, it said Mary's blessed, that means she must be special. Jesus called Peter blessed, and then he went on in the same sentence to say, but it's not because of you, Peter. It's not because of how great you are. It's because of my Father in heaven who's giving you all the right answers. You couldn't do anything without him, is what God says. So much for boasting. So much for credit for the Christian. No one comes to know Christ without the drawing of God the Father and the filling of the Spirit. John 6, says this. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. That verse is full of doctrine, isn't it? No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. You hear the universalist, the person that believes that every road leads to heaven. The universalist will say many times, God's drawing everybody to himself. And Jesus said, everyone that God draws, I'll raise him up. What's, what's he saying? Everyone that God draws, they're going to be saved. Everybody that God draws, they're coming to Christ. They're coming to kneel at the foot of Jesus. Powerful statements in the book of John that Jesus says about himself and his divinity. Look at verse 44 of Luke chapter 1. And by the way, that's not universalism. I have to capitalize on that. Not everybody will be saved because not everybody is drawn by the power of the gospel. The gospel is preached throughout the world to everyone. But there's a special calling and an effectual calling for God's own that he calls and we're awakened in spiritual life. That's the blessing of salvation, amen? That it's not just something that we do, that God actually does something in the heart of man that we couldn't do without him. Even my own salvation, I have no boasting before God for because he did everything. He gave the spiritual birth just like he gave the birth to Mary and just like he gave the birth of Zechariah to Elizabeth. It's only a different foreshadowing and a picture of birth that we're seeing. Look, Luke 1, we'll finish here through 45. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Mary was not only blessed because of the privilege, but also because of her faith and even the blessing of Mary's faith was not a credit to Mary, it was God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Most humbling verse to me in all of Scripture. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Aren't you glad, God, that I had faith in you? God says, no, 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 wait, I'm not done. And this is not of your doing, God says, just like he did to Peter. It is the gift of God, and he keeps going, Paul does, not as a result of your works, because if you could say you did something, what does Paul say? That you'd be able to boast about it. Paul says this isn't of your doing, not as a result of works, so you can't boast. Your only boasting would be in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, even in the narrative of the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus, these miraculous births, there's a spotlight being put upon a greater birth. And that's spiritual birth. That God is the one in the same way who gives life spiritually. You see the messages portrayed. We lose a lot when we focus so much on the narrative, we forget the doctrine, don't we? And there's a deeper message in, in the Gospel of Luke that's being said. Praise God for the birth that He brings 
that gives us new life. At this time, let's bow our heads and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the subtleties in the book of Luke. And Lord, these aren't even subtleties that, Lord, you show us, and at many times we get lost in the text, that you have given the miracle of birth, the physical birth, Lord Jesus. You have protected the baby in the womb, that it is from your hand that this is a miraculous thing. But in the same way, our own birth in Christ is also miraculous. And we should have just as much rejoicing in our spiritual birth as Elizabeth did and as Mary did in the promises of John the Baptist and the coming Messiah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the miracles of birth. We thank you that birth is only a spotlight of a greater reality and that is, our, that is in our salvation in you. We thank you for everything given. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, if um, God is...